she was, yeah, it's good for her. But she gave him a coin, I think a Chief's coin, from uh, Chief Crowell, a challenge coin, which was really nice. She got one, but she, had, yeah, and she gave, which was good, good, really nice. Uh, good evening, folks. Oh, this is a great mic. <laughs> Hello? Okay. Um, I'd like to call this joint workshop to order of March 26, 2018. Start uh, by going around the room, introducing ourselves so we can all know who everybody is. So we'll start with my left, and uh, if you could just introduce yourself and your ward and position, we'll keep on going around. Tom Kendall, Auburn School Committee, Ward 3. Katie Gronin, Superintendent. Adam Hansen, Business Manager. Michelle McClellan, Assistant Superintendent. David Young, City Council at Large. Faith Fontaine at Large, School Committee. Belinda Gary, Auburn City Councilor at Large. Eric Gaudier, School Committee at Large. Leroy Walker, Councilor, Ward 5. Dan Poisson, Ward 5. School Committee. Alfreda Fornia, City Councilor, Ward 4, and School Committee. Jenna Scrivener, Ward 4. Andy Titus, Ward 3, City Council. Bob Hayes, Council, Ward 2. Claudia Hayes, Ward 2, School Committee. Holly Lasagna, Ward 1, City Council. Jill Eastman, Finance Director, City. Peter Creighton, City Manager. Jay Silvec, Mayor Auburn. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. It's great to see you all. Um, hopefully we have a pretty good agenda here. And there's only three agenda points, but they're going to be uh, talked about, I'm sure, in depth. Um, what I'd like to do is just kind of lay down some ground rules so this can go pretty efficiently uh, going forward tonight. So we'll have three presentations. Uh, overall review of a five-year capital plan by City Manager Creighton, followed by a review of fiscal year 2019 by Adam Hansen as well as an update on the new high school project by Superintendent Katie Grondon. Um, if we could save questions as they come to the end of the, if you would, topic genre, for example, on the city CIP as City Manager Creighton's going through it, if we could wait till he's done his department versus line by line, if we could just save those questions to that natural point, that would be great, help speed things along. When we're asking questions, if we could please just Almost, this is going to sound familiar to you educators in the room. We'll raise our hands. Um, I'll call on you, and we'll usually go in a clockwise fashion. That way, everybody gets, uh, the, the, gets the answers to the questions they have. Fair enough? Great. So we're going to move right along then. First item on the workshop today. Oh. I'm sorry, but we had an echo back here. I'm sorry? I'm sorry? <laughs> I did it. I did it. Okay, I thought it was just me, but I don't want to say anything. No, no. I think what they need to do is turn off the uh, speaker on the on the screen. Yeah. They're, They're coming. coming. And here she comes. Okay. okay. Yeah. There you okay. come. Okay. Perfect. There we go. That's going to do Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Jason. How do I sound now, Bonnie? Bonnie. Oh, Bonnie. Bonnie, Bonnie. Wonderful. Bonnie. <laughs> okay. Moving right along then. Um, review of the five-year capital improvement plan. Uh, for the city and school departments. The first item on the workshop is a review of the capital improvement plan for the city. And I'm going to turn it over to City Manager Creighton at this point. Thank you very much. I'm going to stand. Can you all hear me? I don't know if this is on. It is on, I think. What I'm going to do is uh, give you a 30,000 foot overview of the capital improvement plan uh, for the next five years. It's a big picture view. Next week, uh, the council will have a meeting and at that time, I'm going to get into the specifics for the FY19 capital improvement plan as well as the operating budget for the city to share some of my thoughts and receive some comments and feedback from the council at that time. Obviously, this is a document that many people have worked on. The goals of the City of Auburn focus on four general areas. Uh, these are economic development, education, citizen engagement, and strong neighborhoods. We have a work plan that was developed this year for our fiscal year 19 budget, uh, as well as 18 this is the current budget that we're in. 
We begin with the Arbor Lewiston Airport. Again, this is uh, where we're at at this point in time. Uh, this is kind of a wish list, if you will, of items that people have put together. What is in the FY19 column is not what I'm recommending necessarily. These are the requests that have come in. You can see the overall request for the Arbor Lewiston Airport for FY19 is 240,000 and then 525,000 FY20 and so on. For the Auburn Public Library, uh, the requested amount for FY19 is $140,438. And then you can see the, the outgoing years, what the funding is based on this screen. Again, this is a, a work in progress as we move forward uh, in the years to come. These numbers will get adjusted. Economic community development uh, obviously has a lot going on with the city. Uh, we have the new Auburn Village Center uh, revitalization, uh, which has already started uh, for FY19. Uh, there's $886,800 that's been requested, and then $500,000 FY20 and $100,000 FY21. And we have dangerous building demolition line. As you can see, $200,000 for the next four years each year. Then the comprehensive plan property acquisition program and the strategic plan implementation. This line has to do with a strategic plan for the city, which will be launched in May. Cliff Grime has uh, accepted uh, the appointment from the mayor to chair uh, the strategic plan. Cliff is the president, uh, chief executive officer for Harriman, and we've already had uh, some meetings to talk about how we would do that. And this line represents some money that has been put into the CIP for outgoing years to be able to implement the strategic plan. Obviously, we won't know until we have developed it, uh, what we are going to need for fiscal resources. Then you have downtown parking and walkability. <coughs> Under economic community development is uh, the electrical division, and you can see the request there for FY19. Then again, continued uh, with electrical. We have the traffic signal uh, upgrades, uh, LED upgrade uh, to city walking. So the total for FY19, if this were approved, would be $2,067,800. And then you can see the numbers for the outgoing years. Again, uh, this is an overview. Uh, this is kind of, as I said before, a wish list uh, that has been put together. I have been reviewing the CIP with various department heads and the finance director and I'll be coming forward next Monday at the council meeting with some specific thoughts and ideas in terms of what I will be recommending. Under facilities, we have the uh, public works roof replacement phase two for 196,000. The street light purchase and conversion to LED is uh, an exciting, uh, I think, innovative idea that the city is going to be putting forth. Uh, we've already started that process. Uh, this is going to save the city about $160,000 to $200,000 a year when we completed the project. And you can see there are some projects slated for FY20 and FY21. Facilities continued. Uh, there are some projects that we want to do here at Auburn City Hall. Then we also have some need for Engine 5 reception area renovations and a code compliance survey that needs to be done. And similar to the other slides, you can see there are some estimates on future needs. So the total for, for facilities in FY19, if this were uh, recommended and approved, would be 1,032,000. For the fire department, uh, 
we know we need to do some work on the driveway. At this point in time, uh, my thought is we have this strategic plan that we're launching. I think we need to look at the, one of the needs that we have as a city to review our public safety buildings and structures. Uh, there is a desire to have one uh, public safety building, so we'll be considering this driveway reconstruction as we go through this process. Uh, we may end up doing some surface coating with the driveway. We'll see how this uh, project goes. And then we have some other uh, projects in line for FY19 as well based on uh, this overview. So the total fire uh, expenditure would be $575,964 if this were to be recommended and approved. And again, this is just a wish list at this point. Then we have the Ingersoll Turf Facility. There is a desire to have a central air system. Uh, any of you who have been there, uh, raise your hand if you have or you have a child that has. Uh, the Ingersoll Turf Facility has been a huge success for the city. Uh, I was there just the other day, the other evening, and uh, I'm always amazed at uh, the activity there. Uh, we are going to be looking at that issue as part of the strategic plan process and whether uh, central air system makes the most sense or not. Uh, there is some discussion about maybe the fact that the city should invest in a, a new facility that could be used year-round. That will be part of the discussion that takes place during the strategic plan discussions. Again, if recommended and approved, the total cost would be 230000 for the turf facility. Then we have IT. Uh, with an update of the operating system for 200000 if recommended and approved. And then we have the Lewis and Auburn Transportation Committee and Auburn share for a bus replacement. Then we have LA 911. Uh, there's a need for some new hardware refreshment. Uh, so there's an estimate of 85000 for FY19 to accomplish that. Also, radio replacement project uh, for 511000 The $3 million for FY20 is based on an upgrade of the radio system, uh, which the LA911 uh, center has had for over the last 20 years or so. Uh, there's discussion now about whether we should go to an 800 megahertz system or go to an upgrade of the current system that they have. That will be discussed during the budget process. So an FY19, if recommended and, and approved, the total for LA911 would be 596000 Then we have Museum LA. Museum LA is conducting a capital campaign. They'd like to move. Uh, they have a building in mind that they'd like to move into, uh, which is uh, near <coughs> the restaurant rails. And uh, there's been a request of 60000 uh, for the city of Auburn to uh, contribute to that campaign. Then we have the Norway Savings Bank Arena. Uh, those of you who've been there, raise your hand or have a kid uh, or a kiddo who's gone there. Or that's uh, also been a very, I think, positive uh, development for the city. Uh, the arena is very active, a lot going on there. We're looking at an event floor for 125000 flooring for 40000 and striping. The total would be 175000 if recommended and approved. And then we have the police department uh, with vehicle replacement totaling 172000 you can see the other items there. Architect fees for a new public safety facility, uh, something I've talked to the police chief about. Uh, again, we have the strategic planning process. We're going to take a real close look at that and what makes the most sense. Uh, and the police station improvements uh, line item is for improvements here in this building, and we will look at that. Uh, 
the police department has been here now for, is it five years? Six years? So we'll look at that. And then you have firearms replacement as well. And the total, if recommended and approved, would be $787,800. And then you can see there are some items in future years as well. Capital improvement plans are all these works in progress, depending on what's happening. Then we have public services. Uh, obviously, public services is uh, one of our most active departments in terms of the work that they're doing uh, in the city. Uh, very tangible. You can see the work uh, that's going on. We have reconstruction for 1.5 million, reclamation and resurfacing 2.4 million, major drainage. We have an MDOT match and sidewalks. Uh, total engineering costs would be 5.4 million if all of that were to be recommended and approved. And then you have more items here uh, with the replacement of a seven yard plow truck uh, or plow trucks. Also a uh, replacement of a street sweeper and a warm storage building. Uh, right now the storage building that we have is not adequate. And then a portable lift system. <coughs> Continuation of public works. Uh, there's a request for a new paint machine also uh, one-ton trucks and you see other items there as well a pavement reclaimer skid steer water tank and then uh, also an excavator and then a multi-use uh, tractor for the sidewalk maintenance and mowing as well as uh, emergency sign trailer trench box and a sander I love technology. Let's see if I can get out of this without losing it. Brian, where are you? Somebody said try delete. I don't think so. This is an education group, right? Uh, just, just arrow left to right. Click left. Which, I'm, just, Click I'm left. just trying to move the screen. Thank you. Just like that. All right. That was a test. All right. Continuation public works. Uh, you can see there's a need to replace a trailer mounted sign. And at the bottom, you can see the total for public works is 2.4 million, almost 2.5 million, and the total for public services, 7.8 million. Again, this is a wish list of items. Next Monday, I will delve deeper into the capital improvement plan for FY19 and what my thoughts are based on the conversations I've had with the department heads and the finance director and talk with the council and have a discussion and get some feedback before I finalize my recommendations. The Recreation Department has a number of items, uh, 16 passenger minibus, uh, security cameras for Pettengill, sound system for a festival plaza. Uh, we also were looking at uh, finishing out the kitchen uh, where the senior community center is and some upgrades. Uh, at Union Street Park and Chestnut Park, tot lot upgrades, and then the city holiday decorations are a total of 212,000. And here we are, total education, 2.2 million, which you'll be hearing about shortly uh, from Adam, as well as Katie uh, later on. She talks about the school budget. If all of those items were recommended and approved, we'd be looking at over $16 million. Um, my guideline for the capital improvement plan, and 
discussion with the finance director, uh, and we are on the same page regarding this, is we really cannot afford to spend any more than $8 million uh, under ordinary circumstances. So we've had to look hard at this number and look at the different choices that need to be made. And you'll hear more about this again next Monday when I talk in, in specifics about the FY19 CIP. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Crane. Uh, before we, we uh, excuse Mr. Crane, um, just like to go around the room. Are there any comments or thoughts on the city side of the CIP that anybody wants some clarification on or questions? Superintendent Grun? Um, I was wondering if there was any discussion on Harris Street. I know the police chief's here, but there's been a lot of concerns from parents and students on Harris Street coming into Court Street around safety and whether there, there was any discussion on adding any um, lights or what they did at Park Avenue, a warning for students who are walking across that street. So I don't know if that was ever discussed. Dan, you want to? I don't remember any specific discussion, but maybe you have talked about it. Yeah, I, I, he's been involved. Good news. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. That's it. Going around the room, anybody, any questions? Questions? Councillor Walker. Uh, I will make my list and uh, I will send it to the manager later. I can't wait. Don't copy me. Um, <laughs> thank you, Councillor Walker. Yes, community one we got here. What is the current total? What are we working in with this year, for this year? For this year? The CIP for this year is around 7.4. So your average is, is basically half of what they're requesting. That's time. right, yeah. Any other questions, comments? As we're working across? Councillor Titus. Yeah, thank you. Just real quick, um, one thing I was looking at was some of the information we had talking about bonding and not bonding CIP items, and I just want to make it clear that I believe that if something's not going to last 15 or more years, it shouldn't be bonded, and keep it off from the bonds and expense it out, that kind of thing. And also, like I said, I want to see things that are going to add value for the taxpayer and for the educational community as much as possible as a priority. <coughs> Thank you for the comments. Uh, you'll find when I present the FY19 CIP next Monday that uh, we have taken that kind of approach um, on some of the items that are being recommended. We're recommending they be put in the operational budget. Uh, there are other items that we're recommending be bonded. Uh, so I think we have looked at that uh, thoughtfully, but I'm sure we'll have a good discussion next Monday. Could you, woman, uh, Committee Woman Hayes? Come back to you, Councilor Fred. When, when the council met with the Lewiston Council and you were reviewing the joint efforts that we worked together with, one of it, one of the items was um, radios. Um, yes. Okay. And yes. as I listened, I heard that there is a gap, and I could be wrong with this. There is a gap between what the if we had a um, active shooter or a tragedy in the school department, that there is a gap between communications between school department and if, if I could, Jason. city manager, yeah, the, uh, the councilwoman, there there is a gap, and it's something I think I, I don't want to jump ahead, but there's a list of things I'd like to kind of propose to the group here to think about as we go into the second part of this. I think the the first part of the presentation by the city manager kind of puts us all in the the right frame of mood, mind, if you would, uh, to see what some of these line items are, what kind of dollar amounts we're talking about. But to address what you're saying, yes, you're right. Though the capital improvements on the radio system, whether it be uh, a VHF or the 800 megahertz digital, um, do not truly address that. So that is a separate situation, but it's something that I think it's, it's great that you bring up because it needs to be discussed. Uh, along in the lines of you know, future collaboration and how do we streamline organization and logistics and, and technology, frankly. But um, do you have anything to add to that, City Manager? We will be talking about it more next Monday. Thank you. Councillor Fournier. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
I know we need everything, and same thing with the school system as well, but I'm, I'm hoping that what we will do is be able to prioritize. Uh, and based on the recommendation also of you um, as manager and our department heads, I think the, com the communication part is, is crucial uh, in this age of unsafe conditions, and I think we need to look at that seriously as a high priority. I agree with that. I have a radio in my office that I've been listening to the, the communication. I did the same thing when I was uh, county manager in Cumberland County so I can hear the communications going on. I also recognize that my office is, is one location. Um, so we'll be talking more about it as we go through the budget process. Thank you. Is there any more questions? Okay, I'd like to uh, thank you very much, City Manager. Welcome. Um, a couple things, just because this is a joint meeting. I think this is a valuable time. It's a great commodity for us to come together and look at this. Uh, Obviously, the city uh, budget, there it's pretty, it's, it's substantial. There's a lot on the CIP. Now that we kind of went through that and you have copies in your agenda packets of what ex the details, the line by line, the rationales, um, I'd like us all to start thinking about what the next steps are. And a couple questions. Is there overlap? Is there potential overlap in purchasing? Are we purchasing, for example, LED lights um, with regards to the school department? where we could bundle that into our existing contract for municipal LED lighting for parking lots or for streets to dovetail into parking lots. Uh, one ton trucks, are we duplicating any efforts here? There are ways to streamline the process and save money. And I'm gonna talk about the elephant in the room. It's a high school. We've got a multi-million dollar commitment that's soon to be um, staring us, I think maybe in about 30 minutes staring us in the face. <laughs> So it's something to think about. We're going to be asking the taxpayers to take on a substantial financial burden. I will say from a financial standpoint, the right time to bond for the next eight to ten years, Jill, back me up or not, or Adam, is now. Interest rates are going up. Bonds will become more expensive. It's best to borrow money today if we need to versus next year or the year thereafter. Um, and that's cyclic. It'll probably be like that for the next eight to 15 years. Who knows? Um, and it's going up every day, actually, I believe, isn't it? So when we think about all this, and just as a kind of a cautionary tale, let's really look at a critical eye, and there's no you know, safe zone, if you would, on any of this. It's either going to be you know, city, school, everything's on the tables. We can look at what makes the best sense for the taxpayers, for the children, for the citizens with regards to delivery service. Okay, so let's think about those things and make a running list. And if there's ideas, let's, let's talk about them today. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to turn this over to Adam Hansen, who's going to be reviewing the school uh, superintendents. I'm sorry. Yes. Phys the CIP. I'm sorry. CIP. For I'm working to change, Jason. I'm working to change so we can. Are you going to go and see CIP? Okay. Yeah, see so my I, no, I mean, we need to be able to Oh, tech change. Yeah, the tech change. Wrong. Got to ask on that one. Control, yeah, alt, right. delete. Control, alt, delete. And I could hear I you as so. I was walking out. So I don't know what you think I was we're going to do, we're going to, um, Adam, you're going to be up on the CIP then? Yes, I will. Thank Next, you. Next, very good. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, I'm already connected. Let me reconnect. So I'm showing I'm connected. I don't know if anyone can. <laughs> there he is. You should have a login code that you type in, 2205. You see that? Brian will figure it out. So I've already logged in. Let's back. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you very much.
Okay, I think we're up and running. So um, the school department's FY19 CIP plan is uh, building off of our past 10-year plans that we've had in place. And um, so what I'm gonna do right now is walk through what we have on the docket for FY19 at this point in time. This is the plan that was presented to the school committee last week. So as we form our plan each year, we look at our long-term goals, maintaining our facilities for health, safety, and structural soundness, increasing energy efficiencies where we can, and it makes sense, and of course, working toward the long-term goal of replacing Edward Little High School. So beginning our list, we have some roof replacements and restorations. We hired G&E Roofing last year to survey all of our schools. And based on the schedule that they outlined, these are the three schools that would be up in summer of 19 as needing some work, either replacement or restoration. I'll just make a comment. As Jason, you pointed out earlier, you had a roofing project on the CIP list. I don't know which company, but that might be an area that we could have our our person look at what your roof need is and see what if there could be a cost reduction adding your project. Perfect, thank you. Absolutely. Yes, and even though G and E did the survey, they haven't been committed to as the contractors. Okay. Just to clarify, any, anything anything on here right. will will follow our purchasing and bidding procedures when the time comes. Um, completing our LED interior lighting upgrades, there are six buildings. The middle school, East Auburn, Fairview, Franklin, RETC, and the support services building where it's time to update the T8 lighting, which is now 11 years into its life, and to upgrade to the more efficient LED. And of course, we'll pursue all rebates uh, in doing that through Efficiency Maine. School safety obviously is on all of our minds, so we have a couple things here. 19 will be phase two of a security camera upgrade in all of our schools. Fairview, Sherwood Heights, and Walton are the three that are on the schedule for phase two. And in that phase, we'll be replacing 63 cameras and adding nine new cameras, three new cameras for each building. We also have earmarked 50,000 for district-wide safety initiatives. There's nothing specifically identified at this point, but we would, we'll be meeting with our school safety consultant, Scott Parker, as we continue to review safety and see what, what are our priorities and what could we do with some of these funds. <coughs> On the technology side, we have uh, funding in for 80 new MacBook laptops for teachers grades K to six. These are upgrades for teachers who do not receive a device through the MLTI program. Now moving into more site-specific projects. Auburn Middle School, uh, classroom casework, which is sinks, cabinets, bookcases, rolling shelves, etc. cetera. Uh, as you can see in the photo, these are original to the building and uh, most of them are beyond their useful life and do for replacement. So what we will do is go through the entire building with a professional, talk to staff, and identify the specific areas that need upgrades and replacements. There are a lot of doors that don't latch, et cetera. This is, uh, there are a pair of bathrooms in the hallway near the gym. These are the last bathrooms that have not yet been upgraded. These have original 1980 fixtures and partitions and flooring. So those are next on the list and could, would complete all of the bathroom upgrades at the middle school. Edward Little. So the, as we work toward the new building, something that Jill Eastman and I discussed was the need for cash flow. And we'll certainly continue to have those discussions uh, between ourselves and with the Department of Education as we uh, move toward uh, our goal of a new high school. So one of the things we're gonna need is some cash to bridge the gap between a successful referendum and the time when we can issue a bond anticipation note ahead of the full state bond. So a strategy that we used in Lewiston that I thought worked well, that 
we're looking to do here is to borrow 200,000 through the CIP. It'll bridge the gap to the ban, which would likely be summer of 2019. And then once those funds are uh, essentially reimbursed through the ban, the 200 could be used for local only cost of the high school project. Of course, those haven't been specifically identified yet, but we know there are options that would need to be funded through local only funds. So this is one way of covering some of that and trying to accomplish two goals. The other item for the high school is a new Xerox color printer. The one that we have now is reaching the end of its life and they're no longer making parts for it. So this is, a, this is the machine that's used in graphic arts. It's used in the educational program each day as well as doing all of our district printing brochures, posters, mailings, business cards, et cetera. We do all of those in-house. So uh, this is a machine that does a lot of work. It's a workhorse for us. And so that's an estimate, but of course we'd put it out to bid when the time comes. Moving on to Walton School. Original 1933 lockers have seen better days and it's time to address those. They're, <laughs> uh, so it's time to address those again, lots of doors that don't latch and, and things that aren't working the way they should. Looks beautiful. That one does look pretty nice. That's bad case study right there. Inside you can see all the various paint colors dripping down that have been applied over the years. Yeah, if you looked at the floor of that, it, you wouldn't want to step on it. It's... Athletic field fence. Uh, it's time to replace this. That hole is representative of how it looks all around and it's time to put up a new fence around the field. Regardless of what happens with the new school and fields, we know we'll, this is a valuable field for us and we need to take care of it. Stage has no uh, proper lighting or sound. There's a portable sound system that they use and uh, just regular overhead lighting doesn't do an adequate job when this is used for productions or for school gatherings, so we're looking to add adequate sound and lighting to the Walton stage. Bathroom renovations. Uh, in the bathroom, uh, in the basement rather, we're looking at new ventilation, ceiling, and fixtures. And then on the second floor, uh, new countertops are needed as well as hand dryers. In, that, in the second floor bathrooms and elsewhere in the building. In the cafeteria, in the hallway next to the cafeteria, there's currently a lot of boarded up windows. New windows in there will allow for a lot of natural light to come in. We're also looking to replace the old ceiling tiles and reconfigure the ceiling to a lower configuration that'll make a much more welcoming environment for the students and staff. On the support services side, we have a couple vehicle needs. Uh, we need to replace our 1998 tractor that has loader and backhoe, and also time to replace one of our one-ton pickups with plow. This would replace a 2006, and it's one of nine in our fleet. Portable sprinkler, we currently have two, and they are both aging and starting to need more repair. We'd like to add a third to supplement those, but also it would allow us to do all six of our fields in two days and provide greater flexibility for our staff as they maintain our fields. So those requests, grand total 2,258,579. And then there's one additional item that Jill asked me to put on to just keep it in front of us as we move ahead. This was the bond anticipation note that I mentioned earlier. These are the funds that will take us from the successful referendum for a new school into the issuance of the state bond. So if we estimate a referendum in spring of 19 and a bond sale in the fall of 20, which is the date the state has given us, and using a rough cash flow estimate from Harriman Architects, we'd be looking at about 13.4 million and that would likely be issued in fiscal 19. So we want to put that on there and uh, just keep that in front of everyone as a, as a borrowing need. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Hanson. Um, I'm going to open up to questions. I'm going to start off on my right this time, just to be fair as we go across the room, keep everybody on their toes. So, City Manager Creighton, do you have any questions? Not at this time. <laughs> Jill, I know you've seen this before. Do you have any questions or clarification? I just want to make a comment. Um, since this, the high school is such a big project, and Adam and I, neither one of us have done a project like this, we have um, gotten together and he and I are going to go up to the state and meet with the Board of Education and go over how this process works. And then we'll come back here and we'll also meet with the city's financial advisor. I just wanted you all to, to know that we've already got those, that in the works. Councilor Lasagna. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A couple, um, there's some federal funds that are being earmarked earmarked for school safety initiatives. I wonder, if, just to keep an eye on that, I don't know how they'll come down or how you'll be able to access them. Um, what we're hearing right now is money is being infused into the revolving loan, which is a fund that everyone uses for building um, upgrades, and they've added that you can also apply for safety. So it's probably going to be a competitive grant, I'm going to guess, because everyone's going to be looking for those funds. But we've already discussed we need to keep an eye on it. It hasn't gone through legislation that yet around uh, putting that extra funds in there. But yes, it's already on our radar uh, around what we will need for that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and Mr. Hansen, thank you so much for the work you did. It would be helpful to me to not use acronyms, some of which I don't know, which is fine. I'll go back and find out. So that's okay. helpful. And the last thing is, do kids use lockers? We asked that question last week, and we got an affirmative from our elementary school principals. Secondary. OK, that's helpful. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I have a question. With the ceiling tiles at, Wash at Walton, mm -hmm. any surprises in the ceiling tiles like asbestos? <laughs> Not to our knowledge, but of course, if there was, we would have to go through the proper channels to take care of that. And we're, we're looking for a plow truck, but your plow trucks were seven yards and 12 yards, and that's the size of the, the dump, right, in the back? Mm -hmm. We're not, but maybe we could make a big bid together. I do believe there's a couple things to your point, um, Committee Woman Hayes, that uh, I believe in our CIP, we did have a one ton truck purchase in addition to the one that's in your CIP. I could be wrong, so. I think that's a, a point that needs to be addressed. Just so that everybody remembers, the school department plows their own parking lots, and we're responsible for that so we can get school open as early as we can on a snow day. So just an FYI to that. And the, and the city does a fantastic job all over, so. Any other comments on the school CIP? Councilor Titus. Thank you very much. Um, my comment has to do with two things. One of them, the LED upgrade, because the city is doing it for the street lights, and so we see the value. Is it, I'd like to know more about what the value is and the return on investment. I know interior lights may be different than exterior. I also know that interior lights, if it's a strip, it may cost more to replace the strip in 10 years than it's worth converting, mm -hmm. if that's the case. I know I've got some LED lights in my house, and they told me it's got a 10-year life, but when it goes, I've got to replace the whole light, which is not cheap. So, I mean, I would look at that and be very interested to see what the payback is, because I'm in yeah. favor of it as long as it's a return. Right. And I spoke with the local contractor, and obviously until they went in and got all the specifics, they couldn't give me an exact number, but he said an average of four years for return on investment, and it could range from three to six, but that's typically what they're seeing on projects that, that are worth doing. Okay, and, and also maybe you look at the guy that we're using for the, I don't know if they, they're the same exterior lights and this post interior, if it's the same company can mm -hmm. help where we're already negotiating a deal. Yes, and we and we certainly, I know Jill and I will be looking to collaborate wherever we can. And so as we move forward, we're absolutely uh, sure. wanting to look into any uh, going in together with contractors or bids or whatever it may be. So. Very good. And the last thing was on that, when it talked about the, uh, the radio systems, we're not really sure what's going on. We know the school's on a separate system than, say, the police and fire. And I almost think that there's got to be something on the school side for replacement or some sort of equipment that will merge with whatever LA-901 comes up with with their new upgrade. I think that's what they were talking about, was if we upgrade our UHF or if we go to this new system, somehow the schools are got to be on the same system. 
and that won't happen unless you have radios that can communicate with that. So be looking at that for future capital needs. Yeah, and we'll look into that, thank you. Going down the row, anybody? You don't, you don't have to have any comments, Councillor Fournier? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'll repeat what I said at the uh, school committee meeting. I'm very pleased to see attention being paid to Walton. It's a beautiful school and on beautiful grounds. And if we keep that up with the existing schools, I think that's a, a wise thing to do. Thank you very much. I think you also need to take a picture of all of the little love notes written in those, uh, you know, those lockers and probably write a book. Perhaps we could chronicle those. The fundraiser. <laughs> Find real Leroy's written one there somewhere. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Leroy was here in 1933. Um, <laughs> Councillor Walker, would you explain a little bit more about the 13 million point four so I understand more about it? Sure, absolutely. So the uh, if the high school is approved at a successful referendum in June of 2019 or spring of 2019, the Department of Education puts it on its list for bonding because the state will be paying 100% of the state approved costs of the project. And they have already told us that, that bond would be issued in the fall of 2020. So we could have potentially a year and a half not 2020, for the bond. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we could have potentially a year and a half of time before the state funds become available, and yet we're incurring expenses as we get into the school, develop, and start building it. And so the way that always works with the state process is you have to take out a bond anticipation note uh, to get through that period of time. It's, the state doesn't recommend that you issue a bond anticipation note until the successful referendum. So what Jill and I are talking about is how do we get to that point, and then once we're there, how soon do we need to issue a bond anticipation note to get us to the full bond? When the full bond comes through in the fall of 2020, it reimburses and pays off the bond anticipation note. However, any expense, uh, interest expense that's been accrued in that time that hasn't been able to be covered through interest earnings becomes a local only expense. And so that's something we'll have to look at as well as we go through the process. Well, that's it in a nutshell, but we'll be learning more about it when, when we go up to visit the DOE. So th this has nothing to do with if you wanted to buy land for recreational sports or any of that? No, this is strictly a funding vehicle. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. What's the Community significance women got? of the 13.4? That's based on the cash flow estimate we got from Harriman to get from spring of 19 to fall of 20. So it doesn't represent any specific costs other than the anticipated bills that might be coming through in that time. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's sort of dealing with a budget, but not exact. School safety is a very important subject to me and to a lot of us. Could we please have a joint council school meeting and to discuss the safety in our schools and what the plans are as well as what is needed for the communications part? I mean, what we were told at the joint meeting with Lewiston was that today that most of the schools, the teachers rely on cell phones but if it's a big emergency, uh, the cell phones could, I mean, citywide or whatever, the cell phones become useless. So the secondary fallback position, I guess from what I've been told, is you guys rely on the old-fashioned type walkie-talkies. And I think we need something a little bit more sophisticated than that so that we don't lose any form of communications with our teachers, the principals, the school system, the police department, and the city so that everybody's in communications with everyone. Parents knows where their kids are and can find out quickly that their child is in a safe position and not in harm's way if at all possible. 
that way maybe we can relieve people's minds so we don't get the mass fear that we're seeing across the country because in today's age because of what's popping up everywhere with, especially in Maine with all those false alarms I mean, I'm glad that they're only false alarms I mean I don't like them but I'm glad they're only false I want to be proactive instead of being I was going to say screwed when something really <laughs> does well I'm right I'm it's that important to me if something really happens and we're caught not prepared thank Very you good. thank you anybody else any other questions right now is going down the room no anything city manager Craig you had one more thing to add I believe or two more things Excuse two me. more things uh, one question uh, for Katie and for Adam. Uh, I'm wondering what the request was at the beginning of the process in terms of CIP. What, what was the number that you started out with? Um, I'd have to look at last year's list. We basically went through, sorry, we basically went through what was on last year's list line by line and changed, removed, added things. So I apologize, I don't have that number tonight but this is the, the final list that we ended up with. So there was nothing that we felt was a high priority for 19 that we left off this list. We included all of it. Thank you, Adam. I think you understand why I'm asking the question. Yes. The routine has been that we come with you, we come with our highest priorities and then you issue the amount and then we go back and safety is number one, health, you know, so we go through what, what's the high health needs, what's the high safety needs, so we already know what we're gonna prioritize coming out if you were to issue, which happened last year. You know, we come in and then you say, well, you're gonna get this amount. Then we come back to the school committee and we say, these are the things that we've identified. You're taking out all of the joy and seeing the pain that you had to go through, Katie. That's right. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it, is a, it is a difficult process when you very do difficult this. Process, yeah. Yeah. The, other, the other comment that I have is on the 13.4 million, when I was a county manager in Cumberland County government, we had to borrow money uh, to help with the renovation of the Cumberland County Civic Center, which cost $33 million. So we went through a similar process to what you're going through, although it wasn't the state's board of education and the state's education requirements and, and guidelines so it, those may be a little different but what you're looking at is basically the the principal and interest during that period of time so that the number sounds overwhelming in some ways 13.4 million but I, I think what Jill and Adam are going to find out and, and will share with all of us is that I think it's going to be manageable to be able to to do this uh, it's not like we're going to have to uh, fork over 13.4 four million dollars out of the city's general fund or the, or the Department of Education's general fund so Jason yes uh, one comment I believe that was perhaps all the way back to about five years ago when we did have a, a similar meeting uh, and the city at our understanding at that point in time was was preparing itself for bonding so it was reducing the the total bonds that were outstanding not engaging uh, more in anticipation of the new high school so that our bonding capacity uh, in the next few years is going to be adequate to deal with uh, the new high school. And if that information can be brought to the community at some point, that may also be informational. And, and you're right. Um, you're right, obviously, without knowing what the, the magical amount would be at the end dollar amount. Uh, City Manager Crane has done this analysis, and we just got it this morning as well. So I'll let you, or Ms. Eastman, if you'd like to discuss the concept of bonding and maxes. In 2008, the city had outstanding debt of $70 million, and at the end of uh, FY18, we will have outstanding at, of $48 million, which is, like Mr. Kendall said, we have over the last uh, at least seven years since I came back, um, reduced our outstanding debt in anticipation of the new high school. Could, Jill, could you, or, or Peter, could you go on just a little bit more on uh, the maximum number amount of bonded, I mean the healthy number according to, in order to keep our bond rating, just so we understand the window of, that we're working with them? 
Oh, well, currently, every time I um, we do a bond issue, I speak with the rating agencies, and they seem to think that Auburn has a lot of debt, um, and more so than most. But um, I, you know, this there's a a legal limit of debt, which is the city is actually we could bond. Uh, a total of two hundred and ninety seven million dollars legally, which I mean that's outrageous, and we would never be able to afford to pay that back but um so we're I don't think that we're that high, and our bond rating has main we've maintained our bond rating for the last seven or eight years um, and I think as long as we are fiscally responsible and can show that you know we're we're watching our fund balances there's a lot of things that go into it not just the total outstanding bonds and we have been doing that over the last seven years so um, I think we're we're in good shape right now what's well, the interest rate right now um, well it? last year it we got under two percent but uh, I don't believe we'll get under 2% this year. Thank you. It'll Think be probably two and a half. Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing even more, yeah. but that's what I'm getting from my private sector. I will say one thing. Actually, I'm going to say a few things. Um, every time I ever disagreed with a bank, I lost. So, you know, with respect to Ms. Eastman, she's right. I kind of agree with her. But if the, if the people who issue the bonds say you have too much debt, guess what? You've got too much debt. Um, I think if we ever went to borrow money from a bank, they'd probably tell us the same thing, right? It's hard to argue that point. So listening to everybody's comments and, and looking at two very well put together CIPs, thank you very much on both city and, and school side. I want to bring up some, some topics here for us to think about. And I'm going to give it a, a preface it with this. From a policy standpoint, we, the city council, has been working as well as city staff on ways to increase obviously to make Auburn the best small city in New England slash America, depending on which one you're talking with or which person you're asking. Um, in order to do that, there are certain things that we have to be. Number one is competitive. We've got to be fiscally competitive. We have to have a competitive mill rate. We have to, we have responsibility to our current citizens as well as any potential new citizens we want to attract to keep that, keep our taxes as low as possible. But I also counter it with a smart spending, a responsible spending, of our tax dollars from our taxpayers that can show our quantifiable ROI. So here are my comments on what I just saw, and I'd like everybody to think about it, then I gotta find a last to propose to the group. A um, Couple great opportunities, I think, to save money. And Adam, thank you very much, you pointed out one right off the top, uh, consolidated roof contracts. Roofs need to get done, that's a matter of life. Uh, facilities age. By having more roofs that need to be done and putting that under one contract, economy of scale kicks in, we're saving money, okay, on something that is a necessity. Same thing goes with LED interior lights, Auburn Hall's upgrades of $30,000 plus the school upgrades. And on that note, anytime we're doing an upgrade, I believe Councillor Titus brought this up and I want to reiterate it and with a different angle. What is the ROI or the return on investment? We know what the return on investment are with our city upgrades of our utilities, our lights. And it's significant, as City Manager Creighton said, it's almost $200,000 annually pay back in about 3.4 years, plus or minus some months. When we're making these decisions, it's always a, a little bit of sugar makes the medicine go down, so to speak, when we know that it's a capital investment that's going to have a quantifiable return on investment. So if we could, as we're doing final proposals and presentations on CIPs, when, when applicable, when possible, and not to overburden work on department heads, but apply an ROI so that we can actually understand if it's a savings in maintenance dollars, is it a savings in utilities, and so on and so forth. Um, safety consulting, have we uh, consulted with Chief Crowell? Is he part of this process with your consultant to look at overall school safety? Are we going first and foremost to the chief? They, they, they are part of our ASDIRT team, our emergency, Auburn School Department emergency team, the school department is. So yes, they will be part of that. So they'll consult on the initial of the yes. consultants and oh, yeah. moving forward? Yeah. Okay. They've worked with Scott Parker. When we did our active shooter drill, we all worked together. So yes. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Xerox printing. Could we possibly have the school department print for the city? 
And if so, what kind of savings would that be for the city in order to offset the capital, um, that line item in the CIP for the taxpayers? And would it also give some valuable experience to students in that department? Again, it's about ROI. And for the, when possible, not everything government is. I found that out very clearly from the city manager who educated me some. Um, old sound systems. What do you do with your old sound system from Walton if you get a new one? Anybody thought that through? Is the old sound system inoperable? Does it still it's work? A portable. It's a portable sound system. So I don't know if you have any thoughts where you would repurpose it. If not, we would find a home for it in the district. East Auburn would like it. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you, Principal Adams. And there's a point I'm almost getting to. Um, one, kind of, fencing. I have to ask this tough question. Principal Adams, you might want to stand back up again on this, this one. Is, that's Mr. Davis. Davis. Mike Davis. Oh, that's all right. Davis. Um, Walton, fencing. It's a tight shot of one section of six foot fence that has a glaring, needing replaceable hole. $40,000 seems like a lot of fence. I would like a, and I drove through the Walton fence, and while I did not find it visually attractive, I did see a hole. I did not see a $40,000 hole. So if that could be addressed in the CIP, I think dollars could be better spent somewhere else, unless my eyes were deceiving me, and I do hate micromanaging, but anytime there's something that's of significant dollars, I do believe it's cautious to bring it up. Well, I think part of this meeting is to give feedback and have discussion. So we heard True. your feedback and we'll look into it. And that brings me to my last bit that I'd like to talk about. We have on the books a audit and procurement committee that's staffed by school committee members and city council members that I do not believe has met in some time. Um, and I do know I can't, my computer just died here, but we do have, I believe, Councillor Titus and Councillor Hayes from the city side on this committee, I could be wrong. I can't remember who's on it from the school committee. Hayes and Fontaine. Um, I would like this committee to start meeting on a regular basis. Um, I'd like to work, Tom, with you on revising the mission statement for this committee and giving this committee some clear cut definitions on what they should be looking at. I don't believe they need to be looking at procurement of boxes of pencils, but anything <laughs> over in excess of a dollar amount. Um, should be brought together and if this wants to be staffed by anybody from the city or the school department to ask these questions about what do we do with an old PA system often most often than not if we have two separate completely separate in my opinion entities within the same municipality um, that equipment is going to be used within that individual's entity but not potentially be shared across entities so I think this committee is a first step towards going towards what I'd like to see. Um, and I know most of the city council agrees with me and a lot of uh, constituents agree, is more conversation and more bringing together of, in a financial standpoint, the city council or city staff, city administration and school administration. Whether it be joint purchasing and not just talking about it once a year but actually having a standing committee that meets on a very regular basis to talk about all procurements so it's not a last minute dash towards uh, the end of the budget season but also looking at how we can better allow the utilization of funds for education and take away some of the things that potentially could be uh, distracting, i.e. facility maintenance, fields, one-ton plow trucks, plowing of roads, booking of athletic facilities on an outdoor athletic facilities, the booking to third parties of indoor facilities, not just now, but with a new high school. And I bring this up, and I, I think this is worthy of some conversation, but when we're looking forward, and we have to look forward now, how do we best utilize the assets that Auburn has currently and that Auburn will get in the future through this bonding initiative, through this high school initiative? We have been approached as a city by several private organizations that would love to rent facilities from us at you know, X dollars per hour, 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night for adult recreation programs. Dual purpose. It gives great um, activity for adults the social atmosphere that Auburn so desperately needs in the community at large, as well as in increased and additional revenue sources. You know, unused facilities are frankly, you know, not, they're unused. They're not an asset. So that's just one example. 
But taking some of these dollars and shifting in service and support, maintenance, and this might be a very unpopular idea on the school side as well as the city side, by the way. Okay, so let me just come out and say it. From a policy standpoint, we have to save money. We have to save money. In order for us to promote Auburn, to actually live up to the promise of being a world-class city, we have to smartly expend our dollars that are very, very finite. So we need to have some serious dialogue, I believe, and I'd love this to be the venue. Before we move into the high school, because right now we're talking fiscal. And when Superintendent Grandin gives a presentation on the high school, frankly, I'd like our minds to be focused on that, not about the dollars and cents. So this right now is a venue in this workshop to really get through this and, and talk about this so we can look with a kind of a clear mind and a little bit of a deep breath forward. So, so with that said, any comments? Councilor Titus. Yeah, this is uh, uh, Financial Director Eastman on the, the bond uh, payments. Uh, how much do we pay out right now as a city for bond payments? Somewhere around 1.9 million? Or how much do we pay in, to service with the existing debt? In a, well, you total principal and interest? Each yeah. Year? It's uh, a little over $8 million. That we pay out to support the 48 million in debt that we have right now? Yes. Okay. So, I mean, that's the whole point of making sure that we can make those payments and not go overboard, but at the same time, we have the same issue with interest rates rising and are there things that we can do. Um, is the school a program going to go against us uh, when it comes to our bond rating, or are they going to assume that because we're being paid for that, that won't affect our bond rating? I don't, it shouldn't, because it, I mean, it, except that there's going to be a local only piece. So that local only piece will go as part of our outstanding debt. Um, but the, the, the state portion is fully reimbursed by the state or paid by the state. Well, I'm, I'm just saying that I think we got to look forward to what we're now paying and what if we move forward some projects this year or next while the interest rates are reasonable. Because, I mean, all projections are in the next five to ten years, rates are just going to continue to climb and we could be looking at four, five, six percent bonds in not too distant future. Back to the old days. Yeah. So. so you want to spend more money, Councillor Titus? What I'm looking at is things that we have to do. No, I mean, I'm just saying things we have to do, that we know we're going to do them. It may be worth looking at that, that we know we have to do it. I'm not saying the, the wish list necessarily, but, you know. Well, there's a very good point Councillor Titus brings up, even if it means escalating some of the CIP into fiscal year 2019 in order to avoid paying more in tw fiscal year 2020 or 2021. If we can load balance this out with savings, economy of scale, and cutting of unnecessary expenses now in order to bond that for the future, we will save money. I, I believe if I'm paraphrasing what you're saying or trying yeah, to get I to, don't want people to a think potential. I'm a softy all of a sudden. <laughs> It's prudent fiscal sense, prudent fiscal sense. I have an agenda, believe me, but no. I also want to make sure that the city of Auburn gets value for its tax dollars and stuff that we're going to do anyway. We should think about that um, for long-term bonds, not short-term expenses. Any more comments on what I had to say going around? Councillor Walker? Chair yes, uh, one thing, just comment on the audit and uh, procurement policy. That policy, I believe, was revised just two years ago or three years ago it was redone with the city and that does have limits uh, and and spe specifically what dollar value need to be considered when we meet so that there are guidelines already and maybe that policy itself should be revisited uh, if the uh, guidelines are not appropriate to your initiative so and, and the audit committee will not meet until probably June, I would say. Wouldn't you, Andy? Well, typically we've only met just to do the audit right, portion. Right, exactly. And I think what the what the mayor is recommending that we do is we kind of broaden our scope and get more into the procurement part of it. I know there's rules and regulations and, and RFPs that go out and whatever, but the the committee would start looking at what how we're buying and make sure that we're following guidelines and then maybe see some ideas and suggestions on how to save right. money in the future. But without meeting and going over that kind of stuff, we'd never know that. Right. The official name is the Audit and Procurement Committee for Joint Purchasing and Procurement as well as Auditing. And I do have, and I have to dig deeper, thank you for that, um, I just have kind of the overarching mission statement. City Manager Creighton. Just 
Uh, just a couple of comments uh, regarding the, the audit committee. Uh, there is language in the charter that we'd have to look at regarding that. I mean, I, I understand what the mayor is saying about making sure that we're being diligent on, on looking at how we are expending limited resources. I think that's a good goal to have. The other thing that I would say is none of us have a crystal ball in terms of what's going to happen with the economy going forward. Uh, I wouldn't be rushing into trying to expend funds because we think the interest rate's going <coughs> to go higher down the road. I do think we need to be very strategic about what we're doing and make investments that we think are in the best interests of the community. And, and I will add comment, um, the city manager and I, as you know, or may not know, we do meet on a regular basis um, to talk uh, around these type of issues. And at our last meeting, we did talk about, which is one of my slides coming up in the budget, around the electrician um, and use of electrician. And so we discussed uh, putting a plan into place that uh, if the budget goes through for the city around adding an additional electrician, that the school department would uh, participate in that by having the city bill us for electrical uh, use of the electrician. So similar to the printing idea, yes, the city can look at using our printing and then we will bill you for the printing services, which would probably be a cost savings, just like we see a cost saving the printing. The other thing that when uh, uh, the city manager and I spoke is we're not expert in all our departments. Um, we, we know a lot, but we don't know all the ins and outs and the daily work of a department. And so what we discussed is that we would have our partner, our departments meet jointly with us um, to discuss plowing and things that we know have come up in the community. Uh, because we do think it's important to hear from them around uh, what are, what's their workload, what are they able to do, what aren't they able to do. Um, so we can work together to coordinate better. But it really needs to start uh, with our departments and having them brainstorm all the ideas and taking ideas from citizens and from uh, the school committee and city council to vet, vent those ideas, vet those ideas. And then we certainly can have another meeting with our department heads can share what they have see as possible savings and collaboration. So absolutely the CIP is a great start to say what are, we have a lot in common and then how can we go out for purchasing on those items. Can we have this happen before April 2nd? IE department heads? from both the school and the city, peer groups meeting, meeting, reviewing the CIP? Sure. I'm gonna make a big ask here because the clock's ticking yeah, and dollars can. are finite. Yeah. And there needs to be a sense of urgency in my opinion. I don't know if anyone agrees with me, but I'm feeling, I'm feeling our, a little bit urgent. We can look at our calendars, yes. Okay. Any other comments on this? I will ask the uh, procurement and audit committee to actually schedule a meeting before the end of budget season, which is, I just checked, absolutely can get together, have a working group, start meeting, and start laying the groundwork if we could. Councilor Titus, Councilor Hayes from our side, could you take the lead on that? Thank you. Councilor Fournier. This uh, uh, co collaboration ideas is great because uh, we'll probably be shocked to find out how many savings we, we find, and they're all our peeps anyway, so <laughs> I think it's a great idea to look at what we can do together and uh, the benefit of, of our taxpayers. Is there any comment, any more thought process on finances specifically? None? None being, we're going to move on to the agenda, and something I'm sure is very, uh, very much anticipated by everybody is an update on the new high school project by Superintendent Grondon. Do you want to do the budget first? God, budget. We do, no, we're just talking about too many numbers. I'm just joking, I missed that. <laughs> uh, we're going to go through the budget. I'm sorry. Okay. I got number overloaded. So the budget review. It is a lot, of, it's a lot to Grondon take in in first. one evening, I agree. Everybody feel free to get up and stretch at any time. Um, so the budget process continues. Um, part of us coming this evening is part of that budget process, which is just like we did with the CIP, getting feedback around uh, where we are. As you all know, this is the superintendent's proposed budget until the school committee adopts the budget, and then it becomes the school committee's budget. Um, this Wednesday at 6 o'clock will be a, um, the school budget hearing. So part of this evening and Wednesday's evening is to take back any feedback. And then uh, the school committee at next week's budget uh, workshop will go over any feedback and make any adjustments that they want to make prior to adopting the budget, um, which is the first Wednesday of May. Yep, so I do. Yeah. We'll do that. Yeah. Keep it going around that way. 
<laughs> so we have handouts for you. Okay, so um, the first thing is just to remind folks that, and a lot of the administrators are in the audience this evening, uh, and directors and teachers, which is great. And the um, budget really begins with the school department at a zero base budget, so we don't just go with the assumption that everything we had last year, we're gonna spend in the same way. All of our administrators and directors uh, speak to their staffs about budget priorities. Uh, those, the staff uh, turn in budget requests. Then I, uh, Adam and I meet with every department and every director and talk through what their requests are as we put the budget together. So it is built on a zero base uh, budget. We also talk about our Vision 2020, our strategic plan. So if they're asking for something, they often say um, part of our vision is to get out in the community more. So we've added more money in field trips, for example, would be a, a connection to Vision 2020. We also consider whether there's evidence of a strong return on investment. So when they're asking for things or things we may see, are you seeing a return on investment in those purchase? So if there's uh, vocabulary notebooks, for example, they may say, you know, we're not going to buy those notebooks, but we're going to buy this instead because we're seeing a stronger return on investment. So they have to use that filter. And then, of course, considering school committee goals. Um, the good news is with uh, a 2.6% increase to the local taxpayers for education, we are able to address things that haven't been able to be addressed in a few years um, because we've really come in with a maintenance budget um, and just addressing a few things that needed to be done. This budget allows for things that we've kind of put off and I know principals and teachers around when there's class size reduction positions in there, those are very positive. Uh, so we are able to do that. We're able to improve our bus fleet. So over the years, um, you know, we start with two buses in our budget and then when we have to reduce, uh, often one budget comes out. And so our, bu our, bu our budget, our bus fleet, so maintaining our bus fleet. And we have been approved to uh, buy additional buses by the state. Every bus that we purchase is reimbursed. So with an increase in our budget, for buses, next year you will see a re reimbursement, so our state funds will go up to meet the cost of the four buses. Doesn't mean you have to spend that money on buses next year. You're spending it now and you're being re reimbursed for it later. Okay, so it, it, they, they, they reimburse after you pay up front. We also increased our building budgets. Um, so every uh, building has their own budget and we increased around $70,000 overall with our building budgets. We're also meeting essential program and service expectations, who I'll talk more about. We're meeting our contractual obligations for salary and benefits. We're also reducing our reliance on our fund balance. As you know, we, we um, tried to uh, fill in gaps using fund balance with running about $906,000 annually. And so we have redu reduced that. Um, and we're maintaining student uh, services in the face of reduced Title I funds and school improvement grant funds. Uh, so as those funds really have maintained and we've had increase in, in um, our salary and benefits, we're not able to cover the number of positions we need to maintain current services. So our major budget drivers, as all of you know, we, we're all about people. We educate little people. And um, so a lot of our budget goes towards that, which makes up 75% of our budget. 
That increase this year around salary and benefits is at $1.2 million, which is a 4.19 percent increase. And this is all our salary and benefits. The additions and shifts, so this is the major um, uh, infusion of funds that we're looking for, which is new classroom teacher positions at Sherwood Heights, Park Avenue, Fairview, and Auburn Middle School to reduce class sizes. So what we did is we reviewed a class sizes across the board and where these are the schools that at their, sec uh, their intermediate, grades five and grades six are at 26, 27. That's where we look to reduce class sizes. Also, Edward Little High School is asking for a math position um, as they are uh, addressing um, the, the math needs of students. They feel that department needs an additional position. If you were here, and, and, and some of you have been here uh, a while, about 10 years ago, 10, we cut a lot of positions and we often, to save class sizes, cut positions at the high school and middle school. So we're really bringing back positions that were there, and then, um, so that's what's happened, is to protect elementary class sizes, often the high school had to absorb it in their departments. We have um, Title II teachers. So way back, uh, and it was called Clinton money at the time, Title II, you could use funds to reduce class sizes. So we had teaching positions in there, and over the last five years, six years, we've tried to pull those teachers in um, from the title grants to not rely on them. So these are regular classroom teachers um, that have been paid. So when we were, again, reducing budgets, we relied on grant funds to keep maintaining our programming. These are our last Title II teachers um, that, that are going into the budget. Uh, there has been discussion that there will not be any Title II funds, um, perhaps going forward. The federal government may reduce total Title II funds. Um, so that's why we're anticipating if we do get Title II funds, um, we can look at how that will be expended. This uh, school improvement grant at Washburn, they qualify for a uh, school improvement grant, and of course, as, as grants go year to year, that is reduced. Um, so we looked at what are the most high priority return on investment positions that need to go into the general fund, and that's the pre-K teacher and ed tech in the pre-K program. We began a pre-K program at Washburn through a partnership with Head Start. So Head Start helped us start that pre-K program, and then when, um, then we discussed it coming back in to our, um, into the district, uh, and so that's being moved into our general fund. And then you see the cost of the additional uh, buses at 285,000. So we had one bus always in the budget and we've added three for a total of four. And you can see, I think on your slides better what the total amount is. Um, our, it's around $800,000 of new. So those are the big drivers in the budget, positions, buses, and then other things with building and, and things in the, in the different cost centers. Um, so our bu proposed budget impact on taxpayers. So we looked at, uh, we always start with what's the total, and then we looked at the different revenue sources. So I'm gonna pass this paper around that what I'm saying is on this paper as well. So you can kind of see big picture instead of looking at slides. Start at the top of this paper, the state revenue, which is at the bottom of this slide, the state revenue is coming in at $24,493,299. It includes $98,467 for regionalization. So just like um, pushing the city and school to collaborate to, for savings, they're pushing districts to collaborate for savings as well. And so um, we have, uh, and the school committee approved it last week, 
to join a regional service center. It will be called Great Falls Regional Service Center with Lewiston, um, SAD 52, which is Turner, Leeds, and Green, thank you. And with RSU 16, which is mine at Mechanic Falls in Poland. And so um, the 98,467 is in our state funds. It, you will not see an expenditure for the regional service center because um, we're all committed to using the funds that are giving, given to us in addition to this amount of money uh, for our regional um, service center, which is about 92,000. So we talked to the state that we would like to have our budget reflect those funds and not our local funds until we really work through just like us, with, you're in the middle of budget, to really work through what are the savings and what are the needs in our budget um, for next year, and the state uh, did agree with that. So at the top, you can see at the top of this revenue sheet, there's the 24 million. Then you see in the middle the local contribution needed, so it includes um, crossing guards and all debt, uh, except for local major capital. So um, in FY18, we had 17 million, and in FY19, we're asking for 18 million, which is an increase of 2.6%. Um, and people always want to know what is the mill rate impact on that, and based on uh, last year's evaluation, it's 23 cents. That could change and shift depending on where the city evaluation ends up. So. Um, we, uh, Adam reviewed a webinar that was uh, put out by the state reminding all uh, business managers, re-clarifying information around what you can use towards essential programming and services. So you see EPS there, that's essential programming and services. And so we have shifted local debt of $1.7 million into the formula for EPS, which makes us $1.3 million over EPS. So the, uh, what, can be, what doesn't count towards EPS is major capital. So a lot of that, those funds are small, um, you know, like a roof replacement. They don't consider that major capital. So they clarified for everyone what major capital was, which is really new buildings. So superintendents were using any capital improvements in that calculation, not just major capital. Okay, so that got moved. Um, so you look at the total local, the total, and so then we have other revenue. So we made some adjustments to our um, other revenue based on history and what have we been actualizing. So you can see on the purple what we have been actualize, actualizing around revenue and we've adjusted some of that because we haven't been seeing the revenue we had been hoping to see. So there was a reduction in our um, other revenue of 392,000. Now some of that is the fund balance. So if you look at fund balance, we've been using 906, 906, 906, 906. We've reduced that to 600, and 36,000. So we've reduced the use of fund balance by $270,000. Okay. So the fund balance is wrapped into the other revenue. Just so I want to be clear on that. Um, so our total expenditures uh, are up $2.2 .2 million. So when you look at the state and then you take away the local, uh, you, you have the state, you have the other revenue, and the difference is what we ask for locally. Finally, what we talked about with collaboration with the city is discussions regarding sharing electrician and plan department me meetings to identify other areas. Thank you very much, Superintendent Grondin. I appreciate it very thorough. Thank you for the backup documentation as well. Um, we're going to start off to my left. Are there any questions or comments from council or school committee? I'm just going to look around, keep going until I see a hand. Councilor Gary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As of today, who's paying for the crossing guards? We do. Well, the city does. You explain that. Explain yeah. that. 
Are you, are you seeing the shift on the paper? Was that? Yeah. Yeah, so though the crossing guards are in the school budget and will continue to be in the school budget. In the past, we had broken them out on their own line, but we found it's not necessary to do that. They should just be included in EPS. So they're still there, but they're now in the total. Okay, because I know at one time, the school department had paid for the SRO and through time, they, in, well, Improve. I mean, I support school safety, but I'm just saying, for instance, school SROs went from one to more, and the schools were paying for SROs, and then it shifted where the city's picking up the SROs. Correct. And then the crossing guards, I knew they had been always in the school department's budget, and then I'm seeing on this paper now that the local cont contribution needed so I'm thinking, oh, wait a minute, that's something else that's now just got shifted, dropped back in, uh, into our laps. No, the local has always been paying for the crossing guard. It's been listed under there, but now it's part of all the expenditures. It's not broken out. <coughs> oh, so okay. in the total of the 44 million, the crossing guards are in that. Okay, that's, okay, that explains because I was trying to figure out some of these right. this handouts. Okay. The other thing is, If, uh, I mean, you're able to come in sort of lower mm -hmm. on your budget request because of the extra money that the state gave. Right. And now you've added extra positions mm -hmm. that are needed. Right. And the budget's X dollars for this year. Mm -hmm. Next year, we're not exactly probably going to get the same extra money from the state, the windfall of the extra money. So in other words, the city is going to have to make up the increase that you are able to find this city money, the state money for, for this, for what is being paid for now. Not not necessarily because the state's increase was based on them now funding the 55 percent that was required so they finally met that that uh, citizens initiative saying you need to fund it at this level so this is the first year they have met that and they would continue to meet that well, as long as they continue to meet that we would still be funded at that level again next year so in other words there's going to be a guarantee that we're going to have this extra money to cover the extra costs that we're now being covered, we're now covering now. If it's in this budget, that would be correct. Is the okay. state maintains their 55% that they initiated and put in place this year, then we would see <coughs> the additional, they're not additional, and they become what the right. state formula specifies. Because I don't want to approve something on face value to have the rug pulled out when it comes forward for the next school's budget. So, Belinda, those new positions will go into the formula, too. So right. everything is formula-based. So right. we, they count a certain number of teachers we have. With the additional teachers, they'll count additional teachers. So, so we'll get some of an increase because we've added some staffing right. based on the ratio. Uh, and then all the costs are calculated again. So right. it's all adjusted based on what our figures are for next year. But yes, we, and we've always come in very fiscally responsible, so we would have to look at what is that increase and what would the impact be for next year as we build a budget. So, yes. Because I don't want to have to, I mean, I don't want to add teachers and have them depend on having their job mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden say, whoops, but there's no funding for them and then teachers have to worry about which person's not going to have a job next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, going back just a moment, Councillor Young. Now this formula still works pretty much the same way that we're working against figures of two years ago as far as the, the ability to, for the taxpayers to pay. It used to be a three-year uh, look well, back. Now it's just two, I believe. It's just two. It changed, so it's now it's just a two-year look back on enrollment. So we know the student you know, population is they base the formula on. So is this a, uh, to our advantage or a disadvantage? 
it actually to our advantage this year because our student enrollment went up and, and the projections which we had done for the study for the new high school suggest that our enrollment will continue to increase for perhaps the next five years. So that may, would, be, would continue to benefit us. And then I asked the city manager the question, how does this go in part with a um, resolution that the city council has on the, is it the CPU? CPI. CPI. CPI last year was 2.1 percent according to the Bureau of Labor. We're not there yet in terms of the CPI, but it's a good question. Um, I think we're going to have to look at everything. Well, we can override it. I just wonder yeah. where we are. Yeah. I don't know what the latest figure is on that. I would imagine it's, it's going to be yeah. 2.1 percent. Uh, actually, I looked at February. Numbers came out already. 2.1? No. Yeah. Okay. The target yeah, like trailing 12 months as of February. It would take five votes to override it. A majority. Four on a resolution, five on an ordinance. But, um, okay. Councillor Young, good? It's just a, I'm done. Oh, thank you very much. Moving, moving along, I believe there's another question. Councillor Walker. I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but the, the uh, 2 million two fifty six ninety that's still on the backs of the taxpayer because we have to pay 800000 for you to get that money. So that doesn't... The, the, the way I understand it, you would have got three million dollars, but but we will pay we'll pay eight hundred thousand for you to be able to get the two million two hundred and fifty. Is that true or not? There is an increase in local contribution. I yeah. to the superintendent. We don't get it for nothing. Can you, that's for sure. Yeah. Leroy, Leroy, explain it again. Yeah, explain. What does it cost the taxpayer of Auburn for you to be able to get the two point two? Five or okay. the three million, the oh, three okay. million, whatever, whatever number you are getting. I, it looks like it's two two five zero six ninety. So. Okay, so are you asking in order to receive it, what do we need to do to meet EPS, the essential program? No, what, it, what does it cost the taxpayers for you to receive this money? The, 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 the state's not the, in, the increase okay. from year over year right, from so last year to this it's year. It's that question around yeah. local contribution. Yes, yeah. which was sixteen. It's the sixteen million seven eighty one. Now, I, I think you're looking for the cost of the taxpayer or the dollar value, because you already know the dollar value. The cost to the taxpayer. Cost to the taxpayer is reflective of the evaluation of the city and the change of that evaluation. And then the, you apply the state's mill rate to education. That determines the tax the, the tax impact to this to the local we're, citizen. But we're talking, I think, if I could, yeah, Councillor Walker. Easy. It's about 800,000 bucks increase that you're asking the taxpayers to pay in order to achieve that $2.25 million increase in state-sponsored revenue for last year to this year, correct? Our local share? No, okay, yes and no. The 16781000 so I think what you're asking is on the ED279, what does it say the local contribution needs to be? Right, Leroy, that's what you're asking. So the, the um, Local would have to go up $940,000 from last year if you look at it. But we're recalculating the EPS. Okay, we recalculated. So, in essence, if we added, if 2017 18 was looking like 2018 19, so that's where, he's, where he is, Adam, okay? So, it isn't as high as that because we moved the local debt into the EPS formula. So it put us at 1.3 million over the EPS. Okay, so, so say. Yeah. So the that's how we arrived at the local increase is actually the 469,000 this right. year, right. rather than the 940,000. Right. Had we not done the reconfiguring, it would have would been have the been 940. The right. right. So we reconfigured, which helped. Um, the pressure on the local contribution. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Moving along, Councilor Fournier. Um, I know I asked this at the uh, school committee meeting. When you are reimbursed for your four new buses, what do you do with that reimbursement? 
Well, that will be in our 279s next year. So, you know, how we had an increase this year, in the, on the ED 279, it will report four buses at the four bus amount, and that will, that will raise our state funds. So then we'll have a new state number that mm -hmm. would go in there. Okay. They don't tell you, well, if we reimburse it, you need to buy more buses. No. They know you bought buses, and now you're getting reimbursed for that. Right. What do you um, do with your old buses? So we talked about the bus. <laughs> well, we, we decide, you know, we keep, if we decide it's worth more for us to keep them than to get rid of them from a maintenance standpoint, et cetera, we keep them in our fleet as spares. When we decide we don't need them anymore, we usually put them up for sale and hope to get maybe $900 or so for them. Well, we're getting to a couple of things. Nine hundred dollars, obviously, scrap value on that's probably significantly more than nine hundred. But we get get your idea. And, um, but again, this goes back to rec uh, requisition and procurement. And what are we buying? We're we trading out. Are we? What are we keeping for spares? What's the maintenance cost? in? is there an ROI in these new buses? Other than they won't break, which is obviously quantifiable. So I think these are some of the questions that need to be posed um, because there is an asset here. Councillor Fournier, I, I did cut you off. I'm sorry. I'll come back to you in a minute. Or Shouldn't the city have like a list of things that different departments are getting rid of that people, can, other departments can see? You know, he's getting rid of a bus. He's getting rid of a sound system. Good idea. Um, just so somebody, somebody needs it in the city. Yeah. Committee man, I absolutely think it's a great idea. And I think that gets to kind of <clears throat> an example of one of the points that we're trying to make. You're absolutely right. It's a lend lease. What else is going on? What do we have? You know, if we can swap it, trade it uh, non monetarily between, you know, city departments and the school department is part of that, all the, the more power. It's who runs it, who manages it. No, I think we should leave that up to uh, the individual department heads or staff. Councillor Walker. Or actually, Councillor Fournier just had a, uh, one more thing. I'll come back to Councillor Walker. You want to follow up on that? Yeah, after, go ahead. Go right ahead. Go ahead and follow up. I just have a couple more questions. The, my question is, uh, we've been doing one bus and two buses for years, and now, now we've jumped to four, but I haven't heard it. Is it because our buses are, you know, gone to pieces? Or, or could you answer, and maybe you don't want to, but... When we had the deal that was buses were being maintained by somebody else, did that hurt us and, and not better us? It would be fair to say that uh, the buses are in need of some work and perhaps in need of more work than if we'd kept them in-house. But it, the most important point I want to make about the four new buses in the budget is that these will be 100% reimbursed by the state. Uh, so we thought it was important to get the four buses in. We probably won't get this chance again. The reason we're getting four is because we transitioned back to in-house, and that opens an opportunity in the, the way the state allocates the funds for new buses. Uh, so we thought it was important to get them in this year. Uh, we really should be probably looking at two buses in each budget, and there have been some years where we've done one. So this is a great chance to get back on track and utilize state funds to do it. So. Oh, I got a <clears throat> follow-up to that, actually, for council workers specifically. I believe in your CIP uh, description and the, and the verbiage along with us and stated at your last meeting, could be wrong on that, you did specifically point to the fact that maintenance was delayed um, by your, your past uh, contractor. You were very specifically forcing the need to increase procurement on buses due to negligence on their end, on that contract. It was in the, I can't make this stuff up. My imagination is not very good. Um, so I'd like to go back and look at that because... I've heard that several places. I believe you printed it too internally. So I think that's something that should be looked at. But agreed, you know, if the state's paying for it, I do like to remind everyone that we do all pay state income tax too. So we are still paying for it. And it's just one step removed. I do think this is a very good example of why a joint service and support uh, division of both the city and the school department is important combination of mechanics, service protocols, maintenance for all fleet vehicles, uh, unified procurement. Um, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever, and let me be quite blunt, to have separate everything. Not in a city of 23,000 people and static. So I'll throw that out there for everybody to think about. 
Next, Councillor Forney, you get a question? Just because you made the comment about uh, negligence and so forth, uh, when we exited subcontracting, we worked with attorneys to make sure the settlement was fair to the taxpayers and um, to the company. So just don't want people to think right. that they took advantage. Right. So, I, yeah, I just want to be clear. Councilor Fournier, you had a follow-up? Yeah, a couple more. Um, one of them was, I recall, that when we talked about um, all the cost centers, there was a statement mentioned uh, about uh, the need for alternative education for students who um, have uh, developmental delays or, you know, emotional needs. Are we looking at doing anything about that target population within this budget? Um, uh, we, we are not. We, that will be more probably discussion at the regional service center level. Um, we've, I know the directors here, special ed directors here, uh, they have been working with other services uh, outside like Margaret Murphy and so forth to talk about how to best utilize the, the programming we have to make sure we're fully utilizing what we need and then how do we work um, to create our own program. So that is definitely on the goals, but that is not in the budget. Okay, that's something that I'll keep asking. Yeah, oh, I know. Because that's, you know you it's can keep asking. near yeah. and dear to my heart yeah. to be able to keep the kids in-house as much as possible, yeah. and, and the cost saving is, would be phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to start taking some baby steps toward that. Um, the last question I had is uh, with meeting essential programs and, service, uh, and services, EPS, uh, could you talk about the four targets uh, so that people understand what you have to focus on with targets within that? When your when your funding comes through, are you talking about the targeted funds? The targeted funds. Okay. There are the four areas that they're that the state is telling you that you need to focus on with a specific amount of money this year. Right. So there, one there's, being special services. Yeah, one is special service, but it's um, and I have to pull up my slide. But they they put out stuff for um, economically disadvantaged additional right. target funds there. Um, can you pull up? Early, yes, the early education money. Right. Yeah, I think it's important to take uh, to to talk about that out loud so that folks yeah. know these are the areas that you're going to be focusing on, and I think they're very valid areas um, that require a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. It's the second page. Whoops. So we have for um, our targeted funds things that were added. Can you scroll down? Yeah. yeah. So um, is the K-8 disadvantaged targeted funds, pre-K disadvantaged targeted, and 9 through 12 disadvantaged target? And they define disadvantage with the free and reduced. Right. So that's how um, those funds. So we have to identify what we're using in those areas. Okay. Thank you. I'll give them a fair shot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Moving on. Councillor Titus. Uh, thank you. Just a couple of questions. Uh, this is a, this is a um, superintendent's budget at this moment. Correct. <coughs> so it's going to go to the school committee probably starting this week. Oh, no. It's been in the school committee several yeah. meetings. Okay. So they're still They've deliberating. They've had three meetings. They're still deliberating. Do you mm -hmm. project, project any changes or any difference in the budget when that's all done? I think we were waiting for a council feedback and public feedback on this Wednesday in terms of what we have proposed or the superintendent at this point as we've constructed for a budget over the last month and a half. Uh, and then with those comments and, and direction, we, if adjustments need to be made, we would make those adjustments before we vote on it, which then comes back to you for approval and then taking it to the referendum. So the council, I mean, the uh, committee itself won't look at this and make, uh, make decisions on their own. They'll go feedback only. They won't make changes or look at stuff. We've, we've been doing that. We've looked at the, the budget extensively, and okay. that's what we've been doing for most of the winter. Uh, we're now looking for public feedback as well as your feedback for guidance, and we'll take that under advisement and then adopt the budget as our own and then present it back to you for approval and then taking it to the referendum. Okay. Um, just want to know what the process is. Now, I was also looking at the uh, increase. Uh, 1.29 million overall, 4.19% increase in salaries and benefits. That includes the new positions. Yes. Um, what is the increase minus that? I tried to come up with oh, a number. Okay. I thought I'd come oh, up with like 2.5 or 3%. That does not include. 
the 1.29 so does you're not about include this slide, the new let's positions. Go to what you're talking about. So in this slide, where it's 32.9 million for salary yeah. increase, does not include the additional teachers here. So we're having a 4.19 percent overall increase in salaries and benefits for existing <coughs> staff. Correct. And how much of that is the health insurance thing that we don't know about? Well, we budgeted 9 percent, and we are anticipating a reduction in that. We should know. We've been told. Uh, the 1st of April, April 2nd, we got a memo saying they would release our percentage. So one thing the school committee will be discussing on Wednesday night, if all goes according to timeline, is um, what they would like to do with that savings. We've recommended continue to lower the fund balance, but there may be other suggestions on the use of those funds. Tax levy. No, just, no suggestions, you know. No, we thought you would probably suggest that, Andy. <laughs> We were talking uh, about that today, as a matter of fact. The other <laughs> a point I wanted to make across, too, and this is a very, very complicated process, and it I've is. been following it since the state did a quite a few <laughs> things to change how we have to formulate EPS, and mm -hmm. the mill, local mill rate changed, and there was a lot of things that, that added to this. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the, I just have to mention about the bus, 285,000, they're going to reimburse us next year for yes. buses purchased this year. Correct. But if that goes into your general budget next year, it'll kind of get buried in spending. It won't go towards a reduction. Like, for instance, if we spend $285,000 oh, this what year, saying. next year it should reduce what the local share should be next year because the money is being refunded. So in whatever theory. the local share if, would if be, that's, this is, that's this how is you a separate proceed. thing that would be used for that. Seems how we're paying for it this year, mm -hmm. the refund that comes next year should go directly to that. That's just the point. Well, we don't know what you're paying for exactly because it the state's paying for $24 million. Citizens are paying $18 million, so Depends where you put the buses in that pocket. In that well, pocket. That's, I mean, that's what happens when, when they say you're going to refund us, but that's all part of the big picture next Correct. year that is just buried in the entire budget. So we really <laughs> don't get refunded for the buses. It just goes into our, our allocation next year, our subsidy yes, next year. Yes, it so, would. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Any questions coming down? No? City Manager Cren? Katie, I need a clarification on the expenditures. Um, we talked a lot about the revenue side. Mm -hmm. Can you expand more on the expenditure increase side? Yeah, I can. Let me go off and come back on again. I just want to pull up another. I'm going as fast as I can. Yeah, don't fast. Okay, uh, very good question, Mr. Crane. We're going to finish this up. But right now we're going to do a, a break in the agenda, five-minute bio break. We'll go seven minutes just because I'm, I'm feeling generous tonight. So we stand adjourned for seven minutes. <laughs>
you're all set. Yes. Okay, so the question was the expenditures. So um, the school committee, we've been going through the cost centers because those are the um, areas of which the voters will be voting for on the referendum is by cost center. So um, some of the shifts in the cost centers is due to positions being moved around, um, just recoding things to make sure everything is in its right place. Um, so regular instruction has the highest increase, uh, which is good news because that's right where uh, going in the classroom. Those are the classroom teachers, uh, everything that uh, goes for their general bid, their paper, their pencils, the textbooks, all that is in regular instruction. Special education had an increase as well um, of 756,000. Other instruction had a decrease um, and student staff support had an, uh, an increase and some of that is position moving around. But student staff support, other, I'll go through. Regular instruction is everything in the classroom. Special education is, is funds uh, for those students with uh, IEPs. Other instruction is co-curricular. So that's your, all your co-curricular um, summer school, things that are not directly in the classroom but support students after school or in the summer. Student staff support are all the things that support our staff and students. So that would be the curriculum office, um, guidance counselors, Li uh, librarians, those type of positions that support students and staff. System administration is central office, so that increase is mostly around salary and benefits for our system, uh, for our central office. School administration is all the building administrators. Then you have transportation, and so facility maintenance, transportation, there were shifts in there to make sure coding was correct around transportation. And then we have debt service, and then you see the adult ed and crossing guards. So the total increase in the expenditures is 2.294124. All of this is online. I've also given the city manager uh, a full book for you. So um, I've asked him if he, I think usually you have it in your workroom. So when you're visiting and doing your work in your office, you can go through it. Um, but it's also online. So when you look at that number and you look on the revenue sheet, so the revenue needs to match the expenditure. Okay, so that was the expenditure increases and then the revenue needs to match that. And Katie? Yes. What percent increase does that represent on the expenditure side? A 5.49%. Thank you. So last year's expenditures were at 2.3 percent, and our local was up 8 percent. So we, we have, um, so we've reversed that. Thank you. A couple of questions, just point of clarification for some of us who haven't had been able to uh, look at it in detail. Um, just kind of going from the top here, uh, pretty noticeable increases, of course, in regular instruction. But going down to transportation, a $305,000 increase. Your previous fiscal year 18 was with your subcontractor, correct? On bus runs. So now, by bringing it back away from the subcontractor, there's an additional 305,000 that does not include bus procurement. That does include the bus, bus procurement of 380,000 that's budgeted for four buses. So that is included there, but you also have it listed under your CIP? No, it's not under the CIP. So under buses are not. The correct. new procurement is, the is separate. Okay. Um, and then going down to facilities and maintenance, uh, the 5.14, that one, that number right there, okay. Um, it shows a decrease. You had, is there any shift from budget, your operating budget to CIP for facility maintenance? Part of that is shifting things within the budget. As Katie mentioned, during this budget process, we took a lot of looks at coding. This is just where the federal handbook says we need to put things, and we made some adjustments. As an example, we moved uh, photo and copier and printer maintenance out of facilities and into uh, student and staff support. 
that's part of the decrease on the facilities, so things like that. The other thing is we, uh, we adjusted our natural gas lines down in accordance to where things have been, and also um, we're entering a new performance contract with Siemens, and the new payment is about half of the old payment, so that's 100000 out of the facilities. So Siemens is in heat, HVAC? Uh, controllers? Siemens performance contract. We just reached the end of a 10-year. Oh, what, what is Siemens performance? I mean, last time I knew Siemens was HVAC, controller. Yes, they are. Okay. Well, they're doing the lighting. Yeah, they did a lot of lighting and building envelope improvements 10, 11 years ago. They and did boilers. Yeah. helped us bring the gas lines into the schools that we, we needed to bring them into. We had a 10-year contract with them. We did all kinds of projects that needed to be done. Um, after everybody just kind of looked and listened to the expense portion, is there any further comments from the school committee or city council at this time? Kind of bring this to a close. Councilor Walker. I got one. I, I'm, I'm a little bit bothered. I know for five or six years we argued over the uh, EPS model, and I'm still not sure that I understand it because it, if I'm right, you're above this year $1,300,000. And for five or six years, we couldn't even come close to being even. We, we moved, if I'm correct, SROs around, or we took them under our budget, or you took them under yours. Uh, we played around with thinking crossing guards were going to save the city money or save you money. But is it because you've got a new business manager that for some reason we've, we uh, are above a million three hundred thousand dollars? That's a heck of a lot of money to be able to shift around and look. A uh, seven point eight seven percent. It was at, in in the uh, the good. It was clarification from the state on what we could apply to that, and we were able to take local debt, our capital our expenditures, that we had not been able to take in the past, or were not taking the past in terms of calculating it. Right. We applied that. I think it was one point seven. Yeah, one point seven in one point seven million in local debt service that we were able to apply, and so it appeared as though that was a local contribution, which we were not able to do in the past. So that's the huge shift that took place this year, and that's, that's the contributing factor why we are well over EPS, because of that shift in accounting. That came from the state, Tom? That came from the state, yes. Any other comments? Questions? Um, I am, I think Councillor Walker brought up a point, and, and just maybe because I'm a rookie here for a little clarification, so humor me and maybe some of the other rookies in the room. Um, it does seem like we shift costs and expense, um, not revenue, but costs and expense to the municipal side, whether it be how we're calculating or accounting for debt service on CIP. Um, How is that, they do that on their end, or we do that on our end? They pay for their own debt. Okay. SRO, anything else? I mean, are there th so for the school resource officers, how, are, is that picked up by the municipal side? Is it picked up by the school side? What's the true, in other words, is there a true overall cost of education and education support that might not be clearly defined on this? Okay, so your question, there are two different things. One is the expenditures. So, yes, when the EPS is on revenue, and then we talk about expenditures. So when there's been high expenditures around, I think when the SRO conversation, the chief's not here, but when the SRO conversation came in play, we were all looking at ex overall expenditures, okay, not the revenue, it was the expenditures. So it was where does it make most sense for the expenditure to go? So at first, we were carrying the expenditure and then with our need to reduce our budget, it, 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 it was who's going to take this as an expenditure towards the taxpayer. Because it all comes down, we all pay taxes for both. So I know when Clint was here, city manager, we would discuss it doesn't really matter where the expenditure goes, we still have to raise the funds to pay for the SRO. So it's, if it's on our book, it raises our expenditures. If it goes on 
the see what I mean? So that's uh, yeah, what the I discussion mean, was. I'll, I'll be I'll be honest, I don't necessarily agree with the first part of the statement. I do I agree with the second part. I mean revenue is revenue, it's tax dollars. Oh yeah. And at the end of the day, you know, I pay my tax bill like we all do, and we know what it, it's going in general, the fund, but I do believe it's important to have honesty I'm not saying it's yeah. been not honest or dishonest in the past, but a clear understanding of expenditures by school department and municipal yeah. department. Um, you know, whether it be SROs or maybe a myriad of other things that we're not thinking about, crossing guards, for example, where does this happen? Um, so I will make that statement. Is there any other statements on this? If not, we are going to move on to our next agenda item. Agenda item. None being? Okay. Um, we're going to keep it with this superintendent, Mrs. Grondon, who is now going to talk about, which I have been very much waiting for, um, I try to jump right well, to geez, it. I hope we make um, it as exciting as you're hoping for. Um, do our best. So the I just this we were asked about the um, the, the new ELHS building um, update. So I just tried to update. I, I there are members right here. There are four members, five, six members on that are sitting here. So th these are the members of the new ELHS building committee. Just so you have a feel of who those members are, uh, and then there are others that are members that are not voting members. So. And these people are putting in a lot of time and effort um, as we work through this process. <laughs> the, there's an updated timeline. So at the last um, high school meeting, there was an update on our timeline as we worked through the process. Because site selection, as we were all warned, was not going to happen overnight. And so depending on how many sites we looked at, all the work that needs to be done looking at sites, it takes longer than people um, realize. So with the site selection, it's still all, all of this hinges on if site selection continues to go as well as it's going. If everything goes according to plan, um, we hope to announce a site selected uh, at, the, at the end of May, beginning of June. What people have to remember is we're in the winter season when land is frozen and we're coming out of those, so if there has to be any tests that need to be done, we have to wait for that. When all the things that um, need to be done in site selection, that's that technical data for the site, has to all be compiled. And uh, when that's set, there will be a straw vote for the public. Um, we're hoping in May and June. So making the announcement, this is why we chose this site. This is um, all that we know about the cost and so forth. We put that out to the community. The, um, while all this is going, Things are happening at the same time, so don't read it kind of as a list of checklists. There may be things that are being checked simultaneously, depending on. So there's also meeting with public safety, code enforcement, city planning as we talk about um, sites. We have to meet with the DOE every month. So there'll be another meeting with the DOE as we continue to gather data. So every time we're doing data or something happens at the building committee, we are constantly checking in with the Department of Education. Um, they like to know things before we know things or the public knows things. They want to be in the loop at all times uh, because there is a very set process and we need to be following it. Uh, and then they are, as they're putting all this material together, they need a site application complete. And when I say they, that's Harriman. Um, Harriman is our architect firm, and so they are putting together the site application as they're running through all the technical data. They are shooting for, so when they back up, they looked at when is the state DOE board meeting that has to prove our site, and what are those steps. So they're hoping that we will be ready on July 11th to bring to the state board what the site is they need to approve that. So there's a lot of approvals. The community does a straw vote, then the State Construction Committee, committee of the Maine State Board of Ed looks at it on June 29th, and then um, the DOE State Board meeting is July 11th. When that goes yes, 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 um, you move into concept design. So there's also educational specifications going on that Coming up, we have ed spec workshops one and two, and that's mostly with staff and teachers at the high school and the administration teams to talk about ed specs. There are about 10 questions. So there's a, this is all outlined. This is what all these questions have to be answered. 
and that goes into the state's specifications. We've already started some of that work and that's gonna continue. So when the community is excited about a theater program or they're excited um, about uh, athletics or our science program or adding STEM, those type of things, you need to have that in your ed specifications in order for the state to say, oh, you, you're talking a lot about this in your programming. That's why you needed this space in the building. So you can't just create a school without what you plan on doing in the school. Now, there's, off, there's high regulations on that too. So they're still gonna say, this is what the, your high school will have that's state funded. They'll say these are things that we notice you want, but the state won't fund. That's a local, something you'll have to decide at the local level. So they're talking through everything with us. And that has to be all put together as well. Then the concept design begins in August of 2018. And there'll be ongoing feedback with the, uh, the committee, with the community. And then, uh, because the community is gonna start seeing designs, you know, oh, we've been saying we want this, we're looking forward to this. How is that actualizing now in a design? And so people can weigh in on that. S similar to what we did with the site selection, the community came together and said, this is what we're hoping to see um, for a site. So the same thing would happen here. Uh, and then the referendum would be spring of 2019. So we know um, that we may be ready in March, but we may say we're gonna hold off and not do the referendum to June, or we say, yes, we're ready, we would like the referendum in March. But we would talk to the city about all of that as we get closer. But there's a lot of what ifs, so it's not an actual. Um, the reason I bought, brought the DOE process Um, Superintendent Grons is making her way back to her seat. I'm going to open this up for conversation, comments, naming ideas. Just joking <laughs> right. on that one. Oh, I did have one. Well, I, had, I did have another slide. Thank you. Um, so there are, sub, there are subcommittees that are going on. Um, so if you want to be involved, you can be involved. And we have a lot of community members involved in subcommittees. Athletic fields and site design that Scott Anir is chairing. Um, we have performing arts that Jonathan Bosman is the chair. <coughs> we have sustainability building materials and systems at Tom Kendall. And communications, uh, Beth Favra and myself are co-chairing. And we're looking for a chair for fundraising. Um, a lot of the discussion lately has been athletics and performing arts are all gonna need to be talking because we're all gonna be asking the same people for funds, so how do you target um, the community in a thoughtful way. So we need a fundraising committee to really take in what is the needs, um, what is the building committee. So for example, performing arts, the state um, builds a, um, a, an auditorium for a third of the population. So approximately it would probably build for about 350 seats. So there's been a lot of discussion at this committee around the needs for community theater. Uh, theater. And so what is, uh, they've been researching, they've been asking different groups, 
They talked to Lewiston because Lewiston also has been talking about uh, performing arts. So they have been in contact with that and then they're gonna make a recommendation to the building committee. With all our work, this is what our vision is for our high school and then we'll have to say, this is how much the state will pay and this is how much local contribution we'll need for that. And then how do we raise funds for that? How do we pay for the additional seating? Same with athletic fields um, around AstroTurf. It would be the same thing. This, the state's not gonna pay for a turf field, so we have to discuss how would we raise funds for a turf field? How would that, that be funded? So those things are gonna come up in the, in the building committee. Thank you very much, Superintendent Grondon. Um, that was your last slide you I said? Think, I think that, that was it, yes. So okay, we can always come back if you have no more that are hidden somewhere. I think that's okay. Um, just going around the room, starting off to my right. Uh, any questions, comments, city manager, Creighton? I would just say I participated in, in most of the meetings and uh, I appreciate the work that's being done by the school building committee as well as the subcommittees. And I think it's been a good process. I know some people are anxious for information on the site selection, I understand that. I think the, the goal of everyone who's involved is to make sure that the community is engaged in the process and going forward uh, we'll have more opportunity to be able to do that. Okay. Councilor Lasagna. I want to say just to, we need to make clear that the straw vote will be, the people will be presented with one option. We won't be voting on do you like this one or that one better. Right. It's Looks an up like and down vote. I up or down vote then? Yep, okay. I think that's important. Yeah. Um, I think that is it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Athletic fields? Right now, is there money at the state level in the state plan for us to have athletic fields? Oh, yeah. They, 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 and I don't have the exact specifications, but they allot a certain mm -hmm. number of fields, yes. <coughs> Anybody, any other comments going around them? Councilor Hayes? Last week's forum, there was a suggestion made that athletic fields, it would be good if those could go in first mm -hmm. to get the community excited and actually be able to have use of fields close to the construction site so the community could see that facility being built up. Uh, I think when it comes to local funding, uh, looking for donations and so forth, that might also be helpful. Mm -hmm. But the idea of getting people to recognize, you know, the site as it's being developed and just getting people excited early on. I'm all Anybody? Set. All set? Just kind of going around the room. Committeeman Poison, Councilor Walker, anything? Anything going around? Nothing? Nothing? And we're back to the beginning. Okay, so let me fill in some blanks here if I could. Just some comments I've heard from um, people, citizens, constituents on this. First of all, everybody's very excited, okay? Um, that excitement obviously is gonna manifest itself into why isn't it not built now? I could build my garage in two weeks. You should be able to build high school. Uh, I heard that comment actually, and that was interesting. So, but going through this, there's a couple things that as we go through the process, and I applaud you all for getting to this point, I think the, uh, it's a huge undertaking, um, and it's not an inconsequential amount of money. Uh, and I, I look at certain things, and this goes back to our CIP conversation that I had about can really, how do we collaborate a little bit more? For example, athletic fields. Right now we are undertaking, or excuse me, have undertaken a sports tourism study. It was pretty enlightening. It showed that there's a significant economic impact related to sports tourism or tourism in general. Um, certain things that were isolated on that plan uh, as, as things that needed to be addressed were a full inventory of fields and an ease in which to use these fields. So I know we've talked about fields, athletic fields, um, you're looking at turf, and I know you've been invited to be part of our stakeholder group with regards to sports tourism. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but no, that's, that's correct. Um, whereas we're working up on that, uh, there's certain things that we need to look at, such as our main community college is building, uh, what our partners across the river are doing, what we would like to do as part of a potential strategic plan, as part of our vision to be a you know, city of champions, Maine's Urban's playground, you know, back-to-back -back basketball state champs. I mean, there's a lot of, that all ties in together. Uh, 
the biggest thing I heard was community access to any facilities within the school department. Um, I would encourage both city staffs, I think, and the school committee and the city council to look at sooner versus later um, a joint singular point of contact entity for booking of all indoor and outdoor uh, fields or facilities and currently in existence in order to proof out the theory and the model so that the city can actually, to Councillor Hayes' point, see that it's doing what it's promising to do with the new high school today. Let's work out the kinks. Let's use it as a source of you know, pride for all of our, our citizens to use our basketball facilities or our current auditoriums and various schools. So I think that's something that's important. And if we can prove that out, it's going to be uh, a little bit easier, I think, when we look at um, an increase, let's say, of a size of a performing arts facility. Well, uh, when it says it's going to be for community use, we need something to point back to. Like, we have used these facilities over the last two years that are currently in existence. We have hammered out a very good standardized operating procedure in order to maximize the use for all taxpayers and citizens. Um, so I bring that up, and I think that needs to be looked at, again, relatively quickly, because um, there is a need. There is a very large need. And that also goes with being part of the school department and maybe people on facilities or athletic field subcommittees be part of our strategic planning process because there is an economic benefit to your athletic fields in the summer off season and when the schools obviously have primacy aren't using them and how can how do we take advantage of that effectively um, donations could you elaborate on donations because I yeah there's a lot of people asking for a lot of donations from a lot of people how does that work if you could elaborate on that in a municipal school project are we gonna sell a wall to federal distributors Poland spring water are we Listen, I've seen, I've seen the Czech military do that to helicopters, so it is done. Um, so how, how are we looking at that? Yeah, yeah, there are policies on that. So we'll, we're just kicking off that. So that's part of the fundraising group is going to be going over what our current school policies, city policies, around formulating those. Um, Mount Blue did a nice job with their school, mm -hmm. so using them as a model of selling probably everything that could be sold. Um, and then how do you, you know, a seat, a brick, uh, just what you said. So we haven't worked out all those details. That's going to be part of the fundraising committee's um, charge. We'll be outlining that so that the community knows how they can donate, um, what's available for naming. You know, we're going to have to go over all that. We might have Definitely. naming possibilities of the gym, you know, the performing arts center, that type of thing. Yeah. wants to come forward with a big donation. <laughs> exactly. So there are we have policies right now about naming. So we'll have to look at all that. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Um, Still early on that. What are we going to do about the the at the new site where the airplanes are land the airplanes are landing right in front of the new high school? I'm just joking. There's I'm just I was just trying to peel out where the new high school might possibly be. So that was a red herring. It was helicopters. I Royal Royal Canadian Air Force. Um, is there any other questions concerning the high school build out? process, agenda. I know there's going to be a lot of other topics to talk about as time goes on. Um, I was privy to a conversation um, recently that was concerning um, Mount Appetite, the ball fields over at um, off of Garfield Road. Mm -hmm. Right. The city owns the ball oh, at this point. Oh, at this point. Was the rumor true that the National Guard is looking into out, out the rumors? It's in the making. Mm. Well, we try not to comment too much on rumors during joint workshops. <laughs> hearsay and speculation are hearsay and speculation. So, with all due respect, we're not going to probably talk about rumors or speculation. That's fine. <laughs> Very good. Absolutely. I mean, there's, there's, That's the collaboration. I encourage everybody on the school committee, especially on um, uh, athletics facilities, to look at, and it's posted on our website, the tourism facility, excuse me, tourism study that was done by uh, the Huddle Up group. You have very clear and concise specifications of what Auburn needs, one of which actually isn't satisfied in Garfield, which is a, f a clover field, four field clover 
uh, pattern baseball softball mix. That absolutely is needed with hardened facilities in the middle, i.e. scorekeepers booth, announcement booth, restroom facilities, snack shack, and so forth. We do need that, and proper lighting. And that's one of the, the collaborations that can be done. If, this, if the school department needs two, a softball and a baseball field, okay, what else can happen within our strategic plan in order to make, round that out to four? Exactly. Okay? So it's a great point. I will go, if we think about what City Manager Creighton said about Ingersoll, it's a 20,000 square foot indoor turf facility. We had 250 girls from Androscoggin County, only half of them from Auburn, pack our first ever under U14 softball clinic or softball program this winter. They just finished on Saturday. It was sold out within 24 hours. There's a waiting list for next year. The demand, the 1,500 adults in the greater Lewis and Auburn area that are traveling to Portland now for winter adult softball, these individuals would probably much rather travel to Auburn for an indoor facility. Those are just some of the ideas and thoughts. We do live in Maine, eight, you know, a good seven to eight months out of the year, our facilities are unusable, hence the concept of turf, whether we can increase our, our, give our athletes a competitive advantage, increase in basketball facilities, for example, lacrosse, multi-use. Those are all things that have to be looked at and as just a broad, as part of a broader vision with regards to the city of Auburn, where we wanna go, because the high school is gonna be an integral part of that from curriculum to facilities. So they're great points, and we need to really take a deep dive look into that. Mayor, um, one of the things we had discussed earlier about sort of uh, conjoined services among the school committee and the city, I think it's gonna be really important to make sure that we do a scan of what we have out there, what could be return on investment. Just as you mentioned, I assume this would be the, the sports tourism group. Um, scheduling is something that uh, is either going to help us raise money or not? To have no, it scheduling is that's a, and efficiently. It's the biggest complaint I hear right now from the public is our inability to schedule effectively multi-field uh, usage or multi-facility usage in order to attract large tournaments. AAU basketball comes up with a minimum of eight basketball courts needed in the greater area. The only way we achieve that is through um, school participation. So it needs to be a job. I'm not exactly sure where. City manager or superintendent, those, that can, combination should be addressed. Um, that's right. If, if, an AUA, if an AAU wants to do a tournament, I'm not sure they've reached out. So I would have to talk to Mr. The, Benson. The, the problem is director. they couldn't figure out who to reach out to. Right. So we have an athletic director. So that, if, if, if you do mm -hmm. get a question, I think it's good to direct them to our athletic director. And I'm sure if the athletic director had questions, he would then reach out. And anytime somebody has a question like that, that they're not getting the answers, they can reach out to me and I will follow up. Absolutely will, and thank you for that. Usually in um, cases like that, the frustration level peaks after the one wall and then it stops. And that's what I'm hearing about this law post fact. I will, from a, it's something that we have yet to talk about as a council too, so this is by no means policy, but a singular point of contact, um, one person for both city and school that consolidates and coordinates scheduling of activities, obviously with primacy of all schedules, first and foremost, to the school and all municipal facilities, not just school facilities, as that hybrid potentially works itself into reality. That might be necessary for indoor pitchers and catchers practice at a municipal turf facility. We wanna make sure there's some reciprocity there. This is how is the best staff angle and what's the best mechanism to make something like that take effect to address that singular POC with a master schedule on a Google Drive so everybody has visibility, but can be booked by a third party, an invoice generated, and money's collected. So. This is the point too, good collaboration between our own municipal departments certainly, but when we get to tourism, I think such a collaboration should be uh, considered between Lewis and Auburn as well. Because if we truly want to host, you know, some major tournament, you know, Auburn's not going to do it alone. Lewis is not going to do it alone. But again, collaboration would allow such. So I think that I think it's a good idea and a point of contact. Uh, actually, we should be asked. I would think ask Lewis and the same question, do they have a point of contact? We should have a point of contact and they should collaborate. And we, uh, great point, we actually have. Um, and they're working in this very parallel angle, the same way we are, or path, if you would. Uh, they already have centralized POC of bookings between school and municipal in Lewiston. So they actually accomplish this currently. We're a little bit on the lag. 
So, but yes, that, those initial stakeholder conversations between Lewiston and Auburn consisted of that very question, along with an inventory of all assets versus municipal, inclusive of school, as well as NGOs, or non-governmental facilities, Central Maine Community College, St. Dom's, and so forth. Um, by having sparking that conversation, St. Dom's has been very, um, actually very collaborative with us and letting us use at no charge their fields and their facilities for our rec department usage and we've reciprocated. So we really want to start strengthening those, those ties in Auburn and having Lewiston continue those ties and we're all going to come together as a, in the middle because you're absolutely right, Councilor Hayes. For big tournaments, we have to work collaboratively and having two POCs representing a myriad of different organizations with assets makes things go very, very well. Is there any more comments or questions on this topic of the new high school? Committee woman? I just have a quick question in regards to the, the Ingersoll turf and in regards to the Auburn Suburban. Is that something that's maintained by the city? Ingersoll turf and Auburn Suburban do not have a partnership per se. It is a uh, vendor, uh, vendor client relationship. So they pay for hourly usage. Okay. So the Ingersoll arena um, is actually maintained completely by the city. Very, I mean, you probably have a line item. I think that's the closest thing in, in Parks and Rec Utopia that you could find in America, where the thing actually breaks even, maybe even turns a couple bucks if you factor in the returnable canned money. And, and, and we pay fees to use the turf. So when our teams are on the turf, which we have participated in that, we pay a fee for that. Thank you. Yep. If there's no other question I'd like to open up, is there any other overarching comments with regards to anything that we've discussed today? If not, folks, it's 8.07, and I now call this joint workshop to a close. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening.